Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 45. The flush times held bravely on, something over two years before Mr. Goodman and another journeyman printer had borrowed forty dollars and set out from San Francisco to try their fortunes in the new city of Virginia. They found the territorial enterprise, a poverty-stricken weekly journal, gasping for breath and likely to die. They bought it, type, fixtures, goodwill and all, for a thousand dollars on long time. The editorial sanctum, newsroom, press-room, publication office, bedchamber, parlor, and kitchen were all compressed into one apartment, and it was a small one, too. The editors and printers slept on the floor, a Chinaman did their cooking, and the imposing stone was the general dinner-table. But now things were changed. The paper was a great daily, printed by steam. There were five editors and twenty-three compositors. The subscription price was sixteen dollars a year. The advertising rates were exorbitant, and the columns crowded. The paper was clearing from six to ten thousand dollars a month, and the Enterprise building was finished and ready for occupation, a stately fireproof brick. Every day from five all the way up to eleven columns of live advertisements were left out or crowded into spasmodic and irregular supplements. The Gould and Curry Company were erecting a monster hundred-stamp mill at a cost that ultimately fell little short of a million dollars. Gould and Curry stock paid heavy dividends, a rare thing, and an experience confined to the dozen or fifteen claims located on the main lead, the Comstock. The superintendent of the Gould and Curry lived, rent-free, in a fine house built and furnished by the company. He drove a fine pair of horses, which were a present from the company and his salary was twelve thousand dollars a year. The superintendent of another of the great mines traveled in grand state, had a salary of twenty-eight thousand dollars a year, and in a lawsuit in after days claimed that he was to have had one per cent on the gross yield of the bullion likewise. Money was wonderfully plenty. The trouble was not how to get it, but how to spend it, how to lavish it, get rid of it, squander it. And so it was a happy thing that just at this juncture the news came over the wires that a great United States Sanitary Commission had been formed, and money was wanted for the relief of the wounded sailors and soldiers of the Union languishing in the eastern hospitals. Right on the heels of it came word that San Francisco had responded superbly before the telegram was half a day old. Virginia rose as one man. A sanitary committee was hurriedly organized, and its chairman mounted a vacant cart in C Street and tried to make the clamorous multitude understand that the rest of the committee were flying hither and thither, and working with all their might and main, and that if the town would only wait an hour, an office would be ready, books opened, and the commission prepared to receive contributions. His voice was drowned, and his information lost in a ceaseless roar of cheers and demands that the money be received now they swore they would not wait. The chairman pleaded and argued, but, deaf to all entreaty, men ploughed their way through the throng and rained checks of gold coin into the cart and scurried away for more. Hands clutching money were thrust aloft out of the jam by men who hoped this eloquent appeal would cleave a road their strugglings could not open. The very Chinamen and Indians caught the excitement and dashed their half-dollars into the cart without knowing or caring what it was all about. Women plunged into the crowd, trimly attired, fought their way to the cart with their coin, and emerged again by and by with their apparel in a state of hopeless dilapidation. It was the wildest mob Virginia had ever seen, and the most determined and ungovernable, and when at last it abated its fury and dispersed, it had not a penny in its pocket. To use its own phraseology, it came there flush, and went away busted. After that, the Commission got itself into systematic working order, and for weeks the contributions flowed into its treasury in a generous stream. Individuals and all sorts of organizations levied upon themselves a regular weekly tax for the sanitary fund, graduated according to their means, and there was not another grand universal outburst till the famous sanitary floor sack came our way. Its history is peculiar and interesting. A former schoolmate of mine, by the name of Ruel Gridley, was living at the little city of Austin, in the Reese River country at this time, and was the Democratic candidate for mayor. 
he and the republican candidate made an agreement that the defeated man should be publicly presented with a fifty-pound sack of flour by the successful one and should carry it home on his shoulder gridley was defeated the new mayor gave him the sack of flour and he shouldered it and carried it a mile or two from lower austin to his home in upper austin attended by a band of music and the whole population arrived there he said he did not need the flour and asked what the people thought he had better do with it a voice said sell it to the highest bidder for the benefit of the sanitary fund the suggestion was greeted with a round of applause and gridley mounted a dry goods box and assumed the role of auctioneer the bids went higher and higher as the sympathies of the pioneers awoke and expanded till at last the sack was knocked down to a millman at two hundred and fifty dollars and his check taken he was asked where he would have the flour delivered and he said nowhere sell it again now the cheers went up royally and the multitude were fairly in the spirit of the thing so gridley stood there and shouted and perspired till the sun went down and when the crowd dispersed he had sold the sack to three hundred different people and had taken in eight thousand dollars in gold and still the flour sack was in his possession the news came to virginia and a telegram went back fetch along your flour sack thirty-six hours afterward gridley arrived and an afternoon mass meeting was held in the opera house and the auction began but the sack had come sooner than it was expected the people were not thoroughly aroused and the sale dragged at nightfall only five thousand dollars had been secured and there was a crestfallen feeling in the community however there was no disposition to let the matter rest here and acknowledge vanquishment at the hands of the village of austin till late in the night the principal citizens were at work arranging the morrow's campaign and when they went to bed they had no fears for the result at eleven the next morning a procession of open carriages attended by clamorous bands of music and adorned with a moving display of flags filed along c street and was soon in danger of blockade by a huzzahing multitude of citizens in the first carriage sat gridley with the flour sack in prominent view the latter splendid with bright paint and gilt lettering also in the same carriage sat the mayor and the recorder the other carriages contained the common council the editors and reporters and other people of imposing consequence the crowd pressed to the corner of c and taylor streets expecting the sale to begin there but they were disappointed and also unspeakably surprised for the cavalcade moved on as if virginia had ceased to be of importance and took its way over the divide toward the small town of gold hill telegrams had gone ahead to gold hill silver city and dayton and those communities were at fever heat and rife for the conflict it was a very hot day and wonderfully dusty at the end of a short half hour we descended into gold hill with drums beating and colors flying and enveloped in imposing clouds of dust the whole population men women and children chinamen and indians were massed in the main street all the flags in town were at the masthead and the blare of the bands was drowned in cheers gridley stood up and asked who would make the first bid for the national sanitary flour sack general w said the yellow jacket silver mining company offers a thousand dollars coin a tempest of applause followed a telegram carried the news to virginia and fifteen minutes afterward that city's population was massed in the streets devouring the tidings for it was part of the program that the bulletin boards should do a good work that day every few minutes a new dispatch was bulletined from gold hill and still the excitement grew telegrams began to return to us from virginia beseeching gridley to bring back the flour sack but such was not the plan of the campaign at the end of an hour gold hill's small population had paid a figure for the flour sack that awoke all the enthusiasm of virginia when the grand total was displayed upon the bulletin boards then the gridley cavalcade moved on a giant refreshed with new lager beer and plenty of it for the people brought it to the carriages without waiting to measure it and within three hours more the expedition had carried silver city and dayton by storm and was on its way back covered with glory every move had been telegraphed and bulletined and as the procession entered virginia and filed down c street at half-past eight in the evening the town was abroad in the thoroughfares torches were glaring flags flying bands playing cheer on cheer cleaving the air and the city ready to surrender at discretion the auction began every bid was greeted with bursts of applause 
and at the end of two hours and a half a population of fifteen thousand souls had paid in coin for a fifty-pound sack of flour a sum equal to forty thousand dollars in greenbacks it was at a rate in the neighborhood of three dollars for each man woman and child of the population the grand total would have been twice as large but the streets were very narrow and hundreds who wanted to bid could not get within a block of the stand and could not make themselves heard they grew tired of waiting and many of them went home long before the auction was over this was the greatest day virginia ever saw perhaps gridley sold the sack in carson city and several california towns also in san francisco then he took it east and sold it in one or two atlantic cities i think I'm not sure of that, but I know that he finally carried it to St. Louis, where a monster sanitary fair was being held, and after selling it there for a large sum, and helping on the enthusiasm by displaying the portly silver bricks which Nevada's donation had produced, he had the flour baked up into small cakes and retailed them at high prices. It was estimated that when the flour sack's mission was ended, it had been sold for a grand total of a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in greenbacks. This is probably the only instance on record where common family flour brought three thousand dollars a pound in the public market. It is due to Mr. Gridley's memory to mention that the expenses of his sanitary flour sack expedition of fifteen thousand miles going and returning were paid in large part, if not entirely, out of his own pocket. The time he gave to it was not less than three months. Mr. Gridley was a soldier in the Mexican War and a pioneer Californian. He died at Stockton, California, in December, 1870, greatly regretted. End of chapter 45